Let us pray. Holy God, we are grateful for new beginnings, for new school years, for a new season. As we gather this morning, help us to focus our minds, our hearts, our spirits on you, that we may grow closer to you and leave this place ready to share your love with one another. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Let us join together now as congregation in singing hymn number 66, To God Be the Glory, Great Things He Hath Done. Hymn number 66. Let's stand as we sing. Good morning, friends. How are you today? Is anything exciting happening this week? Well, today was Permission Sunday. Different classes. Are you starting anything new this week? School. You're starting kindergarten tomorrow. All right. We got, cool, we got some new classes. We got some new grades. Some of you have already started, but it's still kind of new, right? Very cool. All right. How would you have a sweet with me, sweetie? All right. So I have something here. Shh. There are a lot of you and only one of me, so let's take turns, all right? What is this? Driver's license. What is this? It tells you who I am, right? Last week, I had to go on an airplane. I went to Atlanta. And before I got on the plane, I had to show them this to prove I really am Erin Collier. That's me. It's got my picture on it, and it tells you a little bit about me, right? 
It's got my name on it. It has my birthday. It has my address on it. It tells you a couple of things. But does this tell you everything about me? Does this tell you what my favorite color is? Does it tell you what my favorite food is? Does it tell you what my favorite drink at Starbucks is? No. There's a lot this doesn't tell you about me. How would you learn those things about me? You would ask me. You would spend time with me. Like you said this morning, this is your second time you're in this children's sermon. <laughs> so this will tell you a little bit about who I am. But to really get to know me, to get to know things about me, you spend time with me. And it's the same way with y'all. I get to know y'all by spending time with you. Maybe on Sunday mornings or Wednesday nights or maybe even during the week at ECM. Well, this morning we are talking about a story where Jesus was with his disciples and he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they had some answers. And he said, well, who do you say I am? And Peter said, you are the Messiah. You are God's son. How do you think Peter knew that? Did Jesus have an ID he could pull out to show them? Yeah. No, they didn't have a driver's licenses back then. He knew that because he had spent time with Jesus. So he had spent time with Jesus to learn about Jesus and realize that Jesus was God's son. So this week, as maybe you're starting a new class or going somewhere new, I want you to practice spending time with Jesus, maybe by praying, maybe by reading your Bible. You're spending time with Jesus right now at church to get to know Jesus a little more. All right, let's say a prayer. God, we thank you for your son, Jesus. Help us to learn more about him by spending time with him. In your name we pray, amen. All right, if you're in first grade, remember, stay up here. Everyone else can go. All right. Right, first graders, come stand up here. All right. Stand in a row. As we said, this morning is Promotion Sunday, and tomorrow these students will start first grade. Except Haley's already started first grade. In first grade, that is a transition in our church when they the children transition from the preschool department to the school age area. Um, a lot of fun things, fun opportunities for them. But one of the hallmarks of that is as a first grader, they're starting to get pretty good at reading. They're learning how to read very well. And to commemorate that, co to commemorate starting in the children's department, it is our tradition to give them a Bible. So that as they are learning to read and as reading is becoming part of who they are, the Bible will be one of the books that they will read. So this morning, we have a Bible for each of these children. Will. Will Strickland. There you go, buddy. Evan. Evan Blackley. Caitlin Reedy. Ben Gavashi, Haley Nickel, <laughs> and Cole Satterwhite. And along with the Bibles, we have a bag. And they got to choose the colors of the bag, and they all chose the same colors. All right, guys, in your bag, there's a workbook to help you learn a little bit about your Bible. All right? So you can take the bag, and you can put the Bible in the bag if you want. You want to do that? That's good. You don't have to read them. All right. There you go. I wish you all could hear all the comments that are being made up here. This is heavy. This is hard. How in the world are we going to read all of this? Those are more important questions than you realize right now. Okay, because those are very important questions. The Bible is a heavy book, but it is also a book that just is so exciting to read. And it's a book that tells us the stories about God and tells us the story about Jesus. 
and the Spirit and being God's people. And how are you going to read all of that? Well, you're going to start learning to read, and some of you already know how to read, but read your Bibles to your mom and dad and to your brothers and sisters and to your friends. We have given you a very important gift in giving you a Bible, and we want you to enjoy it, okay? In your worship bulletin, you will see a litany that we as a church read uh, in honor of this occasion, uh, and then ask that you join me in our litany. Today, we celebrate a special moment in the faith journey of our children. These children have grown among us as the children of God. We have lovingly nurtured them in the faith that we all share in common. Today, we present each of these children with a Bible. Through the study of these written words, these children will continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Receive this holy book. Learn its stories and study its words. Its stories belong to us all, and these words speak to us all. They tell us who we are. They tell us that we belong to one another, for we are the people of God. We rejoice in this step in your journey with God. We pray God will guide you, your family, and us as you use this Holy Bible in your home, in your Sunday school classes, and in our worship. As we give these Bibles, may we commit ourselves again to our responsibilities as followers of Christ. May we be found faithful and living according to its truth. Amen. Amen.
When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I shall give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you have loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thank Thanks be to God. God. Let's pray. Almighty God, help us to listen. Help us to hear your voice and obey. Teach us. Move our hearts so we will spend more time with you in prayer. Help us study your scripture. Help us to try to live like your son. For the more we do these things, the more we hear our master's voice. This world is a loud place. Money talks, as the saying goes. Our culture has a lot to say as well. Politicians are never at a loss for words. We seldom cut our televisions, radios, or even Pandora off long enough to listen. Satan is constantly whispering to us that we are not good enough. That voice inside our heads reminds us of failures from our past. We have so much talking at us that we do not hear you talking to us. These distractions are not from you. So let us consider the source and listen only for your voice. In these moments of silence, please speak to us. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. Let us join together now as we sing our offertory hymn, number 420, Jesus, the very thought of thee, hymn number 420. Let us stand as we sing. <laughs>
Let us pray. Father, we come to you in prayer as always to praise and glorify your name. We thank you for this beautiful Sunday morning, for this church, and the opportunity it provides each of us to come together as a body of Christ. We know you are with us. Because of our faith, we trust you. Let us use David's message today to gain strength and knowledge from the tax collector's words, who is the foundation and cornerstone of our faith. Let us bring these tithes and offerings into the storehouse, all your money, talents, time, and love to spread the good news. In your son's strong and holy name we pray, amen. I will not claim to have appreciated or even understood everything that the man did. But on more than one occasion, Robin Williams made me laugh, made me smile with all of his antics and his comedic roles and movies. He brought a lot of laughter to this world, and his death reminds each of us or teaches us how serious depression can be. And if we have a loved one who suffers with depression, we best hold them in our prayers and offer the gift of our presence to them. As I have thought about William's passing, I have asked several friends about their favorite Robin Williams movie or role. I've had folks tell me that they love the Dead Poet Society 
or Mrs. Doubtfire, or the Fisher King, or his voice in Aladdin. I didn't see each all of those movies, but the ones that those that I saw, I thoroughly enjoyed as well. My personal favorite Robin Williams movie would have to be Patch Adams, but my all-time favorite role of his was when he played Sean McGuire. Sean McGuire was a psychologist in the movie Good Will Hunting. In Good Will Hunting, Matt Damon, another actor, plays this young man who has led a very hard, difficult life. But yet he is brilliant. He has a genius level mind. But because of the difficulties of his life and his environment, he has little hope of a good future in being able to use his gift. He is discovered, however, by one of the professors at MIT, where Matt Damon's character Will happens to work as a, as a janitor. Will was working one of the equations that was left up on the board, and the professor notices this and immediately realizes that this young man has a very special gift and intellect. And the professor wants to tap into this great skill that he has. But before he can do that, he has to help Will work through some of the emotional baggage and difficulties that he is dealing with and refusing to deal with. And so he calls on Robin Williams' character, Sean McGuire, as a psychologist, to help Will unlock his potential. Will and Sean meet for the first time, and it does not go well at all. Will is so defensive, having so much hurt and pain in his life, not willing to let anyone close. He is so defensive that he begins to analyze Sean McGuire. He notices a small paint-by-numbers piece of artwork that Sean has done. And he begins to analyze it and figure it out. And before long, he has gone way beyond the boundaries and is stepping all over Sean's deepest pain, the loss of his wife. In a very violent scene, it ends. But the next scene is my favorite. In the next scene, the two are sitting very quietly on a park bench overlooking this little pond and Will begins by making jokes, once again, about Sean. And Sean sits back and says, Son, I realize something about you. I, I've been thinking about you. And, and, and when I realized this about you, I, I haven't given you another moment's thought. Well, Will is intrigued, and so he asks, well, what, pray tell, did you realize about me? And Sean, Robin Williams' character, says, I realized that you're just a kid. You've never been out of Boston, have you? And Will shakes his head, no. But yet, you are a kid who has such a great intellect. You are so smart. You're a genius, but still, you're just a kid. You see, Will, if I asked you to tell me about art, you'd probably give me the skinny on every art book that's ever been written. You know all about Michelangelo. You know his technique. You know his thoughts. You know his ideas. You know his political aspirations. You know his relationship with the Pope. You, you know the whole thing about his style and how he worked. But... You've never been in the Sistine Chapel, have you? You can't tell me what that room smells like. Because you've never been in there and looked up onto that ceiling and seen that glorious, glorious piece of art. And if I asked you about war, you might quote Shakespeare to me, one more time into the breach, dear friends. But you've never been in one, have you? You've never been at war. You've never had shots fired at you. And you don't know what it is to have your best friend's head in your lap as he is gasping for his last breath, 
looking to you for help. You're just a kid. And if I asked you about love, well, you might quote me a sonnet. But you have never looked into a woman's eyes and been totally vulnerable. You've never known someone who could level you with her eyes, feeling that God has put her on this earth as an angel just for you. And the mere audacity at the idea that she thinks that God has put you as an angel in her life. You could tell me all about love. You could probably even tell me about some of the girlfriends that you have had and known. But have you really loved? Have you really given your heart to someone? You don't know anything about that. You don't know what it is to love. You don't know the strength or the depth of love. Of how it enables you to get through everything. Even something as torturous as cancer. You don't know what it is to sleep sitting up for weeks on end in a hospital room. As you watch your wife die slowly from that disease and you hold her hand. You don't know what it is to to see the doctor come in and not say something about visiting hours because they know that that term does not apply to the kind of love that you have for one another. And then Sean looks to Will and says, you're an orphan, right? And Will nods yes. And Sean says, do you think that I know the first thing about you? That I know the depth of the hurt and the pain and the isolation and the abandonment that you feel because I have read Oliver Twist? Does that book encapsulate all there is of you? Of course not. It's a brilliant scene. Because it truly captures the difference between knowing about and knowing. It captures the difference between a a familiarity with and a true intimacy. It covers the difference between being familiar or or, or knowing about it and truly having an intimate, in-depth knowledge of someone or something. In the passage that we look at today from the 16th chapter of Matthew, Jesus asks for both kinds of knowing, both kinds of understanding. He and his disciples have ventured north to Caesarea Philippi. It's about as far north as we see them go. Historians and archaeologists tell us that in this day and age, Caesarea Philippi is a place of great natural beauty. There were waterfalls there, a place where you could go and enjoy the beauty and the grandeur of God's creation. But it was also a place that was very rich in religious diversity. People of all different faith perspectives and religious thought gathered there. And in Jesus' day, it was a place that was central to the worship of the emperor. A great deal of diversity there, but also a great deal of beauty there. And it's in that context that Jesus helps his disciples clarify some things. Clarify their most basic or foundational understanding. It's amidst all these people and all this diversity that Jesus says, You all have been out there amongst those people. Tell me, who do they think that I am? And it can almost see a little grin, a little bit of a a laugh come to the disciples as they start to recount all the different stories that they've heard about Jesus. Jesus, I heard one of them tell me that they thought that you're John the Baptist. And another one says, well, I heard someone say that Jesus is Elijah. And another one speaks up and says, someone asked me if Jesus was Jeremiah, that they hadn't quite figured him out, but they knew that he was one of the prophets. Now, each of these were flattering statements and compliments to Jesus. John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, they were all good, godly men, but none of them were Jesus. The crowd's understanding or idea of who Jesus was teaches us the very important lesson that you just can't rely on what other people say 
when you're trying to answer life's most important questions. The crowd knew about Jesus. They knew that he was a good and godly man. They knew that he was a person who had come from God in some way, who had an amazing understanding of the scripture. They also knew that he was a healer, that, that he had powers from God, but yet they only knew about God. They teach us that there's really no substitute whatsoever for knowing, for experiencing And for truly having an intimacy with God through Christ. The truth is, you can read all the books that you want to about art, but until you see the Sistine Chapel, which I have not, you just don't get it. And you can read all the romance novels that you want, but until you give your heart to someone, which I have, well, love is just a dream. It takes experience. It takes giving of yourself. It it, it takes understanding for yourself. Now, there are some experiences in life when we can just take other people's words for it and just kind of go with the flow. You can let someone else decide what's for lunch today or what you're going to do this afternoon or what movie you're going to see next. And if it works out, fine. If it doesn't, then no real harm But in life's biggest questions, you better do your own homework. You better study for yourself. You better figure this thing out for yourself. That's what Jesus' next question to the disciples demands. I've heard you say what the crowd thinks, but now I want to know, who do you say that I am? You better do your own homework. You better know for yourself. That's the approach that Greg Vayman has taken. Greg is someone that some of you may know. He's a dermatologist who's actually practicing down in Wilmington. A few years ago, he wrote his spiritual biography, and it's an interesting book. Several years ago, Greg says that life was just kind of cruising right along for him, that he had reached a lot of the goals that he had set for himself. He was in a good practice, had a wonderful family, loving wife, two small little boys, could pretty much buy anything that he wanted or go anywhere that he wanted. Life was was treating him pretty well. And as a person who grew up outside of the church, he really didn't have much need or concern for religious questions. He knew that perhaps there is a God and and he had heard of Jesus, but it, it never really captured much of his attention or or thoughts or questions or or anything because as a doctor who valued science, he, he truly believed that there was a logical, explainable, scientific reason for everything or explanation for everything. So the whole idea of God was just not something that he needed to worry about. But a series of events of events takes place in his life that he talks about and and actually some experiences, some bad experiences with Christians who are not treating him and his family very well. And so somewhat angered by this experience, he takes a Bible and, and somewhat sequesters himself, spends several nights all by himself just pouring into the Bible, reading the Gospels and then the Epistles and then even getting into the Old Testament and the prophecies. And his whole intent is to try to disprove Christianity. I will show them, he said. I will show those Christians who are mistreating me and my family that there is no God. I'll take the rug right out, of their, right out from under their feet. But the thing is that the more that Greg studied the scripture, the more that he got to know Jesus Christ, and not only what the scripture says, but the the evidence of it, the, the heaviness of it that our children spoke of, the more he became convinced that this guy may be more than just some fella who invented his own religion. The more he studied, the more he began to pray. And as he prayed, he gave not just his mind to an understanding of God in Christ, but he gave his heart and spirit as well and asked the Lord to save his soul. 
It's an amazing conversion experience that he talks about. And as I read the book, the, a book that one of you gave me, I, in all honesty, was a, a bit concerned at first because he, here this fellow is just, he, he's not going to the church and asking for any help. He, he's not consulting a pastor for any wisdom or any direction. And I kind of think pastors are important to your spiritual direction and guidance. But, but this guy's doing it all by himself. Now, he did talk to a minister once or twice and, and wasn't really pleased with what he heard, but he, he basically sequesters himself and, and asks for no help, and, and that kind of bothered me. But when I hear Jesus' attaboy to Peter, I can at least warm up to the approach and can begin to understand that perhaps that it does have some merit. Jesus looks at his disciples and said, you've told me what everyone else is thinking. Now put all of that out of your mind. And now you tell me, who do you say that I am? What do you think? And I don't think Peter just raises his hand and blurts it out. But rather, I think with a very calm, assured voice, Peter says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And that little smile, that little grin that was on Jesus' face as he thought about being referred to as John and Elijah and Jeremiah, it just gave birth to a full smile that just covered his face. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. Well done, Simon. You've been listening to God. Sure, you've been listening to others, and, and there's a time and a place for that, but you have been listening to God. You have the very best source of all because it is God the Father who knows who I am. Well done, Simon. I am going to change your name from Simon to Peter and I'm going to build my church on the kind of faith that you are showing today. Oh, Peter, I've never been so proud of you for listening. It is a beautiful moment that Jesus and Peter and the disciples all share. And the part of me that always likes to listen for, for the, the backside of this story is I want to know, hey, Peter, when did the Father tell you this? When did you hear the Father say that Jesus is his Son? How did you know that Jesus is the Messiah? Did, did the Father just pull you aside at some point and just say, Hey, Peter, he's the one. Now, if you know Peter's life, if you know the Gospels, you think there might have been a couple of occasions where Peter is, has this information because there are at least two times in the Gospels where the heavens open up and the Lord announces that Jesus is indeed his son. The first is in Matthew chapter 3, where Jesus is being baptized. He comes up out of the water and the skies open up and the, the heavens cry out, This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. And, and we may be thinking that Peter was there, but Matthew doesn't mention Peter there. In fact... He probably wasn't. Because in Matthew's telling of the gospel, the disciples are not called until the fourth chapter of Matthew. And this announcement is made in Matthew 3. But still there's another chance, and, and we do know that Peter was on the Mount of Transfiguration. And, and at that point, the same thing happens. Peter and James and John go with Jesus up on the mountain and the heavens open up and a voice cries out, This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. That's the moment we think that Peter heard from God. And Peter did hear from God that day, but the only problem with that being the day is that that story takes place in Matthew 17. And here we are today in Matthew 16. It hasn't happened yet. And I know the Bible does not tell us every story in Peter's life, nor does it tell us every story from Jesus' life. 
And so it's very possible that, that perhaps in some very mystical, spiritual, intimate, personal, prayerful way, the Father said, Peter, he is my son. That's possible. But I want to give Peter a little bit more credit than that. Peter, this very impetuous person, but also this very perceptive person. I think he has been listening to the Father all along the way. And not just listening with his ears, but listening with all of himself. Peter was listening with his hands as he struggled to pull in that net that was somehow miraculously filled with fish. A net that he had thrown 50, 100 times the night before and come up empty every time. He's listening with his hands as Jesus provides a miraculous catch. Jesus, or Peter, I think, also listened with a very full stomach as he ate the leftovers of bread and fish that Jesus had blessed and fed the multitudes. Peter listens with his eyes as he looks out from that boat on that stormy night and he sees Jesus walking towards them. And then he even listens with his own legs and his feet as he dares to step out of that boat and to step out onto those waves. Peter listened with all of himself, not just with his ears, but with his hands, his stomach, his eyes, his legs, and his feet. So blessed are you, Simon, for this has not been revealed to you through flesh and blood, but through my Father and heaven. And he has been revealing this to you day by day, hour by hour, moment by moment. Blessed are you, Simon, because he has been revealing this to you grace by grace. Every breath of your life. And blessed are you. Blessed are each one of you. Blessed are you, for God has been revealing the same to you. If only we will still our spirit to know. Friends, we do not need to hear a voice. We only need to open the ears, the eyes, the hands, the feet, and the heart, and to listen. Listen to the Father tell us who Jesus is. The late great preacher, Carlisle Marnie, Baptist preacher, used to say that when the rabbi stands before his congregation, he says, thus saith the Lord. And when the Catholic priest stands before his congregation, he always says, the church has always said. But when a good Protestant preacher, and especially a Baptist preacher, stands before his congregation or her congregation, he says, brothers and sisters, it seems to me. Well, brothers and sisters, when it comes to answering Jesus' question, it seems to me that I best let you answer for yourself. Let's pray. Gracious God, you look into the eyes and penetrate into the very soul and spirit of each one of us and ask us this question that you asked of the disciples. Who do you say that I am? I wish, O oh Lord, that I could answer for every one of us and to say that we all believe that you are the son of the living God, that you are the Messiah, that you are the source, the substance of our lives. But I cannot, and so I will not. We must answer this question for ourselves. But Father, we each have the source that leads us to the truth. Your spirit speaks to each one of us 
day by day, hour by hour, moment by moment, and grace by grace, if we will have the ears to hear and the courage to speak and to live. It's in the name of the Christ that we pray. Amen. So who do you say that Jesus is? Who is your source for answering that question? It's possible that some of you are here because you know other people who are here and you think if, if the church, if Christianity is good enough for them, it's good enough for me. Well, that's commendable, but that's not the best answer. The best answer is one that comes out of your own intimate relationship with God through Christ and through the Spirit that has informed and inspired you. And if you would accept Christ as your Savior and Lord today, if you would come to this place today and say, I know who Jesus is, He is my Savior, and He is my Lord, then I invite you to come. Let's stand together as we sing our response.